Welcome back from lunch and from visiting museums and seeing the sunshine and all of those wonderful things. We are um, now going to move into our panel entitled Global Circuits and Asian Migrations. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sebastian Pranga, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History here at UBC, who is going to uh, introduce uh, our panel and comment on it. Thank you, Neil. Of course, thank you for putting together this wonderful conference. I'm going to introduce all our three panelists together so that we might catch up a little bit on time and then have enough time for our ultimate panel this afternoon. So our first speaker is going to be Sarita Amruti. Her image, her object is the Tata Indica car. Sarita is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Washington. She completed her PhD at Chicago in 2008 on producing mobility Indian IT workers in Germany, where she looks at a very interesting period um, in Berlin, when both Berlin was refashioning itself as a city and also allowing this new inflow of high-skilled workers from India in, um, in interesting contrast to earlier um, waves of immigrant labor, especially from Turkey. She published a number of papers and edited volumes, and her new project, about which we will hear today, continues to investigate the relationship between India and information technology, this time not abroad, but within the subcontinent, with a focus on how India's IT boom is affecting class and caste relations in urban India. Then our second speaker is Renisa Mawani. Her image is the steamship Komagatu Maru. She is an associate professor here at UBC in the Department of Sociology. Before coming to UBC, she did her PhD at the University of Toronto and was then also a postdoc there. And she's published just last year her monograph um, at, entitled Colonial Proximities, Cross-Racial Encounters and Juridical Truth in British Columbia, 1871 to 1921. And Renisa is now engaged in two additional projects that again combine her, combine her expertise in law and society with her interest in transnational history. The first on legalities of nature uses Stanley Park here in Vancouver as a case study to examine the role of law in the construction of nature. And her second new project, which we will hear about today, traces the iconic voyage of the Komagatu Maru. And our Final panelist is Chris Lee. His image, his object are the boats that you see just outside here. Um, Chris got his PhD uh, from Brown in 2005, where he also did his MA and then postdocs at the University of Illinois and here at UBC before joining the English department as an assistant professor in 2007. Chris has published widely in the field of post-colonial studies and on Asian Canadian critical practice and is currently finishing a book on the role of aesthetics and identity politics in Asian American literature. And pertinently to what he will be talking about today, he is the co-investigator in the project Waterscapes, a major three-year project that investigates Chinese migrations in a comparative transnational and artistic framework. So these are our panelists, and I ask you to join me in welcoming Sarita Amruti. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Sebastian, for that welcome, and thanks, Neil, for organizing this great panel. Okay, so I am talking today about the Tata Indica. Um, same slide, different uh, format. Okay, so the Tata Indica is a car that was introduced by Tata Motors in 1998 to the Indian domestic market. It is billed as the first indigenously developed car, which I think is very cleverly indicated in the kind of Latinite naming of the vehicle according to certain taxonomies, so Tata Indica. Um, and it's one of a series of new cars produced by Tata 
that gestures towards the Indian middle class, gestures towards middle class desires for indi individual transportation, and also towards the ways industries in India are approaching both domestic and international consumers. But my interest in the Tata Indica today emerges from its popularity as a car to transport call center and IT workers to and from work. The Indica is popular uh, for the transportation of workers from their homes to workplaces and back, in part because it's relatively low cost. It costs about 350,000 rupees, three lakhs, which is a about 7,000 to 7,500 dollars. In addition, it has all the mod cons, if you will. It has uh, power windows, air conditioning, um, a, a CD player. It builds itself as a kind of car in opposition to older Indian cars, which were rather large and had cranked down windows, which are still used very much for, for taxis, for instance. OK, so my previous work. Uh, which Sebastian mentioned, and it's actually an ongoing project, uh, studied the ways that IT workers from India circulate through Europe. I explore these movements through the term migrant pro programming in order to make the point that programming becomes global in part through relying on and recreating difference in subtle and overt, blatant, uh, overt renditions of ethnicity and race. And here, uh, just to show you, this is, was an ad in a, um, a publication going to India from Germany. He, he's saying, I wouldn't be where I am today without my German qualifications, and he's a professor of engineering in Madras. And this is a kind of cartoon circulating in local news media, and the translation is, uh, well, it, it, of course it looks strange, but he has a green card. And the green card was a particular uh, visa legislation to allow high-skilled migrants into Germany. So you can get a sense of, of that other project. These explorations led me to write about the hidden relations of power and partially obscured forms of work that make the circulation of global computer programming possible. The cars and drivers I want to talk about using the Tata Indica prompt uh, are at the other end of a spectrum of Indian IT work from diasporic elite programmers. But they are equally necessary to its structure. So now I'm going to bring you to Pune, and just to say what's underlying both of these project is, uh, projects is an interest in the kind of gritty underside of virtual economies. How are these material instantiations of difference actually producing something that from the outside looks quite free-floating and virtual in all the ways that it's usually talked about? So Pune, which is in the western state of Maharashtra, is interesting for any number of reasons. It was the seat of Peshwa power during the consolidation of the Maratha Empire in the long 18th century. It was the site of a British contentment after 1818. And uh, it, its old city has these very lovely um, Vada structures, which are old courtyard buildings. And I'll just show you a few shots of those so you can see the contrast. Here's the entrance and an interior courtyard. That's the courtyard that you saw before. And uh, these buildings are marked very much by these open galleries that either look into the street or look into the courtyard. Okay. But none of those wonderful things are exactly why I'm bringing you to Pune today. I'm bringing you to Pune here because I'm interested in a further layer in the historical unfolding of Pune city, namely its emergence as an IT city. Okay. And these are just some scenes of the old city in Pune. And you can see that it, it's re relatively crowded, that their scooter culture is a huge part of Pune. Pune is also uh, a university town. It has many institutes of learning. And these are the book stalls that sell and recycle books, at these days mo mostly computer programming books, so Java, C++, uh, for all the students who are studying there and hopefully want to be absorbed by the IT market. And this is just a great shot of, even outside of the center old city core of Pune, you have um, scooter culture because it's simply the easiest way to get around and it's very popular, uh, and a kind of rather dense uh, city structure here. So the other part of Pune, which is where I'm going to take you now, is a place called Hinjavari. Now Hinjavari is really a village. 
It's on the outskirts of the city, but it is also now home to what's known as the Rajiv Gandhi IT Park. This is a software park, and you can see already the incredible contrast right, in terms of the density of the old city and the expansiveness of, of this park. What you see here is the headquarters of Infosys, which is one of the big players on the Indian software scene. Okay. So the estimated migration to Pune from 1991 to 2000, which are the two dates of the last two censuses, is 360,000 people. So approximately 360,000 people migrated to the city over those years. And there'll be another census coming up this year, which will give us a sense of how that migration is moving. That represents 15% of the total population of the city. So it's a relatively large uh, number. Most of the migrants to Buna are in some way related to this IT industry. So let me show you some other images of Hinjavardi to give you a sense of the world in which IT is being produced. This, oh, this is a, a great thing. This is just simply to indicate the, how deeply this new layer of identity in Pune City is being produced. This just happened to be in the back of the door in uh, the place where I was staying. It used to be the room of someone who's now gone through the Pune University system and lives in California as a software engineer. And the back of his door was this incredible map of Pune that labels it as Silicon City, which is a new naming. Pune has all these other identities in terms of its relationship to Maratha culture, the cult of Shivaji, and anti-colonial uh, power in the subcontinent in the 18th century. And now there's this kind of new layering on top of that of Pune as a Silicon City. So here you can, these are other uh, shots of Hinjavardi. Here you can see some IT workers going to work. Construction, the thing is being built as we speak. Buildings are going up. Credit Suisse, this is Wipro in the background. Okay. And this is just a close-up scene of a, one of these workplaces with these sky bridges in which people can talk on their mobile phone, discuss their latest project, get some air, and, and so on and so forth. Construction everywhere. Right. This is Hinjavardi as it looks from the one, uh, the, the one road that goes through what is rem a remnant of the old town or village and leads on either end to either Pune City or the, the IT park. So you can see that there's an incredible change and contrast happening that's visible on the landscape. Okay. So I'm trying to move us now towards all of those peripheral players those hidden technicians, one could call them, using Ben's language from yesterday, who have emerged around the software parks and make the whole industry possible. These are roadside uh, chaiwalas who are also selling various snacks and stuff. Workers, IT workers love to use them, but also rickshaw drivers. Okay. Here you can see this figure here is uh, dressed in the typical garb of a local to this place. He's wearing a white topi and a, and a white kurta, which marks him, in contrast to these guys over here, as being local to place. And I, I don't know what he does. I didn't talk to him, but he could be a, a, from a chai stand. He could be from a local farming community or, or just live in the area. Okay. So back to the Tata Indica, giving you a little bit of background here. So how uh, I, I spent um, a month doing research on the Tata Indica this December in Pune, and I want to just try to map out for you the political economy of call center drivers, because it's relatively unexplored, and I found many uh, interesting things that I didn't know before I got there. So according to IT company managers, central offices predict one or two days in advance how many workers they will need for a particular, particular shift using averages that take into account the nature of the project, time of year, and peak call times in Europe or the United States. Within that projection, there are always variables, and it is critical, especially in call center and tech support work, that the transition between one shift and the next is seamless. There should be no time in which clients on the other end, i.e. in US or Europe, are not covered. So anytime we pick up the phone, we need to be able to reach somebody at the other end. There can be no gaps. This is critical to the business structure. Okay. 
What is more, many of the jobs that call center and tech workers do are on US and European hours, meaning that they're working the night shift in India. Having a pick up and drop off a service for nighttime shifts makes it easier for workers to come and go at the office at odd hours. And IT and call center companies uh, really stress having drivers controlling the movements of the workers so that it's not up to, to, the, to the call center workers to come in on time, but they assure that they're always punctual because they've put in place a system of drivers. Okay, so how do the drivers get hired? How does that system work? The IT and the call center companies like Wipro or Infosys or Credit Suisse do not for the most part run the driver operations themselves. They outsource driving duties to a third party called travel agencies. Travel agencies hire and manage drivers and their cars. According to the owner of one travel agency I spoke with, travel agencies used to own their own cars. But as the industry grew, they found it easier and more cost effective to outsource this part of the business as well. So you have a kind of fractally recursive system of outsourcing, starting in the US, moving to India, within the Indian firm, to travel agencies. And now travel agencies are also outsourcing some of the work of finding cars. They no longer own their own fleets of cars. So you can already see the number of people who are drawn into this business that, from the outside, have nothing to do with IT work. So as it now stands, the IT firms employ travel agencies who guarantee, this is in their contract with the IT firms, that the workers will arrive on time for their shifts. The travel agencies then hire car and driver. The cars come from third parties. These third parties lease, rent, or allow drivers to use their cars in the service of travel agencies. Now these third parties remain, uh, as of now, a kind of ambiguous figure in my work because uh, it was intimated to me several times that the owners of the car are owning them in essentially to launder black money. That they have some kind of shady connections and a good way to manage that is is to own a car. Whether that's true or whether that simply represents some of the concerns and fears around this new economy, I think is an open and very productive question to ask. Okay. So what about the drivers? Okay. The drivers, and this is something that I, I just found out is very new, earn differential wages depending on the card they drive. So the Tata Indica is both the most popular car and also the low man on the totem pole in this economy. If you can hook yourself up with a larger car, one with more features, one that's more comfortable, you will earn a higher salary. It has nothing to do with seniority, the number of years you've been driving, or anything like that. Okay. Um, the salaries for this kind of work are higher than work being done for other drivers. So some drivers I spoke to used to drive police sergeants around town, and they switched to call center work because it paid a bit better. Starting salaries in this to drive a Tata Indica is about 8,000 8, rupees a month, which is about $200. Now, how do they make money on top of this? Well, here again, you see an incredible mirroring between call center and IT work and the work of drivers. In a, in a standard call center or in IT work, you can get prizes for uh, reaching certain quotas. And the same principle applies here, too. If you always deliver your goods, in other words, the call center workers on time, you'll receive an incentive. It's a kind of bonus operation. Right? So the effects of this are clear. The, the, co the cars are racing all around the city you know, and, and uh, trying to get people where they need to go. There are also incentives for keeping your car clean, for always showing up in uniform, and for being polite. And I'm going to get to why those things are important a little bit later in my talk. I just wanted to flag them for you quickly now. So the price paid for taking on this better paid work is in fatigue and long hours on the road. Okay. Call center drivers are on duty for 10 hours at a stretch, 10 to 15 hours at a stretch. And for every 24 hours uh, of, that they've been on duty, they are by required by law to have eight hours rest. So you could theoretically be driving people around the city for seven or eight hours at a time without any kind of break. 
So the question of techniques and strategies to maintain this incredible level of concentration and speed is a very interesting one. A few of the headquarters that we looked at in the previous images have rooms where drivers can take rest and socialize, but most of them don't, which means that drivers also sometimes sleep in the car. Uh, they rely very heavily on those roadside chai wallas that we saw for injections of caffeine. And they're constantly improvising ways of keeping awake and on time, at the same time creating spaces for moments of rest within their cars. Which gives a kind of whole new meaning to the call center car as an object which is prompting my investigation. It can also be a bed. It can be a, a place for all sorts of other um, legitimate and non-legitimate activities. Okay. So from the perspective of the travel agency, there are also certain things that are very illuminating talking to the supervisors. These agencies are responsible for the actions of the drivers. This is written into their contract with the IT companies. That kind of work of disciplining is also being outsourced. Okay. And this had a particular resonance after a series of women across the subcontinent were raped and murdered on their way to and from work in 2007 and 2008, including 22-year-old Jyoti Chaudhary, who was raped and murdered outside of Pune by her call center driver and an accomplice. Now, that story sent shockwaves throughout the city, uh, in part because the IT industry is considered to be a clean and safe industry, which implies a large number of women. The majority of women working in call, uh, people working in call centers are women. And um, many people, the general idea is that it, it is a safe environment for young unmarried people to work before they get involved in other sorts of domestic economies. So in the aftermath of that particular incident, um, the, cost, the, the travel agencies instituted a number of rules and regulations in conversation with Pune local police. So all call center workers are handed a kind of bill of behavior when they take a job. And I'm just going to read out to you some of the things that they're told. One, stay in touch with the base while waiting for a pickup. The base is the call center or the supervisor. Do not enter a car alone. Females should not enter a car alone. Females should not enter a car if another man is present other than the driver. And passengers should be aware of their surroundings at all times. Now this last point becomes particularly interesting in the case of Pune, which is a small city, and many of the roads in Pune still do not have names on them. So all of the drivers, as opposed to other places in India, are local Bunaikars. They are from the neighborhood because they know the roads. Okay. Whereas the call center workers can be from everywhere in India. So there's a number of very clear lines of stratification going on here. One is between the creation of a gendered labor force and how that uh, may put into question certain ideas of masculinity. Another is between insiders and outsiders. Insiders, the drivers are insiders, whereas the call center workers are coming from all parts of India. And I think the Tata Indiga, just kind of using that as a prompt, is a way to work ourselves into some of these deep changes that are happening because of the incredible growth of the, of the IT industry uh, in India. Okay, so, so what do I want to say about this entire political economy of work? Okay. Uh, before I get to this, back to the Tata Indica, just for, just for a few minutes. The other incredible thing about these cars, looking at them in the landscape of Indian roads, is how bare they are. And if any of you are familiar with scenes of India, if, if taxi cabs are often completely decorated with paintings and stickers. The stickers often refer to place names or religious figures. So on the back of cabs in Bombay, you'll have Tane, which is an area, or a picture of Shivaji, or a, a picture of a god. And they're always 
all public transportation vehicles and almost all private ones have some something in the front of the car in order to ensure the safety of the driver. It could be a statue of a small god or a garland of flowers. It can be as elaborate as an electric display with moving parts and music. Um, so there's this incredible densely layered tradition of ornamentation around vehicles. And these cars are just quite amazing because they have an almost ghostly presence in the cityscape. They're, they're always clean. Most of the time the cars are white and they're completely and utterly without ornament. So when I asked some, some travel agencies about that, they say that, you know, there used to be a tradition of putting bumper stickers on the back of the car with the name of the travel agency. But in the aftermath of some of these incidences of violence and the changing ownership around the cars, the travel agencies decided that the cars needed to be blank so that they would not be responsible for what happened to the car after hours, in other words, on weekends. One of, the, one of them said to me, well, we don't know where the drivers are going to take them, so we don't want our names associated with them. They no longer own the cars. Okay, so what do I want to say with all of this, with the Tata Indica? So tracing the car draws a kind of map. It moves through a landscape linking together actors that otherwise remain hidden. These actors, including the car itself, are an extension of a field of power. Things, makes cuts, things make cuts in the flux of life that are necessary to thinking and are all around us but remain largely unnoticeable. And within the framework of how the computer industry has been thought about in India, in general terms, those who are non-elites are figured as the recipients of technological innovation. And the main problem to be solved is to ensure that non-elites have adequate access to technology. And I think this is very well uh, portrayed in this image here from the IIT Bombay Media Lab Oh, sorry, that shows uh, a farmer sitting on his bicycle using solar panels to power his laptop. Uh, and you, know, you see this great village scene in the background. So he is obviously the recipient of technology that's going to help him manage his farming, and there's a bird here, in all sorts of ways. This is the typical way in which technology is brought together with a study of power and power differentiation differences. Uh, and what I wanted to point out is the history of the Indica and related ghostly vehicles that haunt, kind of make a hauntology uh, within the streets of Pune City, is that it really points to this other underbelly, this gritty underbelly of the industry that as of yet has, has not been recognized and is occluded for, for a very good set of reasons or clear set of ideological reasons. Uh, so for me, what this project brings up is, in the first case, uh, the problem of what Heidegger called uh, inframing. That is how technologies, like computer technologies, frame the world in particular ways. And of course, the attendant problem of what lies outside the frame or is occluded by it. So how does the frame of the computer technology as something that is virtual, right? And how does the frame of the recipient of the technology as someone who needs access to it occlude or frame out all of these other kinds of uh, unseemly labor, as it were, that, are, that go into making that framing itself possible? And my second concern, I suppose, is with how the hauntological uh, or the ghostly presence of IT economies bubbles up and makes itself known in public life. And I'd like to suggest that the itinerary of the Tata Indica th through the cities uh, points up the, this ghostly presence uh, uh, of other sorts of economies within the, the space of IT. So the Indica is one such ghostly underpinning of information technology that moves through the cityscape. And it can be read uh, and followed for the ways that it maps out a particular political economy of work, labor, violence, and inequality. Thank you.
Okay, so there will be some overlapping sort of themes with uh, Sarita's presentation, I'm happy to say. Um, so the object that animates my talk today is also uh, a mobile one, um, and it's the Komagata Maru, a Japanese steamship that carried 376 passengers, mostly adult men from Punjab, uh, which on May 23, 1914, was prohibited from landing in Vancouver, uh, not too far from here, actually. Um, so following Neil's uh, directions, <laughs> I jokingly said that he planned my itinerary. Um, so following his suggestions, um, I want to spend the first part of my talk just uh, giving you a sense of the sort of impetus of uh, for the ship's journey and its circuitous route. Um, and then the second part, thinking a little bit more about global encounters, um, itineraries of literal and epistemic exchange, um, which I hope might actually sort of uh, raise questions around methodology, which will be our final itinerary for the day. Um, so the Kamagata Maru's journey was initiated in 1913 by a 55-year-old entrepreneur named Gurdit Singh. Um, and in many ways, he himself was an embodiment of global encounters. So Singh was the son of a farmer um, in Serhali in Punjab who left in the late 1870s to follow his brother um, to Malaya. Um, and there he worked for a Chinese pork dealer in Taiping, eventually becoming fluent in Chinese and Malay. Um, he pursued a number of uh, businesses, including a dairy where he supplied um, members of the Sikh regiment uh, that was stationed there, and eventually acquired his wealth through railway contracts and rubber planting. Um, he was described by the Sikh community in Malaya as being a very charismatic and influential figure. Um, but what we also know about Singh, and this is sort of what brings him to chartering uh, the Komagata Maru, is that he was also a very lit litigious man. So there was, um, he was engaged in a considerable amount of litigation in, um, in Malaya, and um, this is what brought him to Hong Kong um, and made him aware of the dire conditions and circumstances of other Indians, um, a sensibility that was really sort of instrumental to the Komagata Maru's journey. Um, so one of his many lawsuits was against a business partner, um, and he went to Singh went to Hong Kong um, and stayed at the Gurdwara there, and had first-hand accounts of the men who had traveled from India, many of whom were unemployed and desperate to find their way uh, across the Pacific to Vancouver. Um, so migrants such as Gurdwara Singh, who had left Punjab in and traveled to Southeast Asia in the late 19th century, frequently sent news uh, regarding places of migration that were hospitable, and Canada was at the top of the list. Um, many sort of romanticized uh, the West Coast as being very similar to Punjab, having very similar landscape, um, and that there weren't the same sorts of problems that existed in the United States, for example. Um, and many of the men that Singh had encountered in Hong Kong had arrived with these sorts of aspirations to journey across the Pacific and to start a new life, but with very little success. So he's there, he's in this Gurdwara, he's uh, you know, known to be this very charismatic figure. Um, and so some of these men approached him and you know, said, look, we need help getting across, what can you do for us? Um, and they had, several, had already made several unsuccessful attempts to charter a ship. Um, but Gurdit Singh accepted this challenge and viewed this as a patriotic duty that would elevate his status amongst nationalists in India, as well as in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and through his circuits and networks, he was very well aware that Canada had passed restrictive legislation aimed at preventing Indian migration. Uh, through his contacts with the Sikh diaspora in Vancouver, he was also aware that a recent continuous journey provision, which I'll explain in a few minutes, um, had been struck down in a recent case called the 39 Hindus. Um, and for Singh, this presented a limited sort of window of opportunity to pursue his journey and to fulfill this commitment to both the men that he had made a promise to in Hong Kong, as well as to the nationalists in India. So he made several attempts to try to charter uh, a ship, um, all of which were unsuccessful. And finally, um, in 1913, he was successful in chartering the Komagata Maru, um, a ship that had its own itinerary of exchange, 
built in Glasgow in 1890 for a German company, sailed as the Cecilia for the Hamburg America line, and then later owned by a small Japanese company and the only company to make a deal with Singh. So the Komagata Maru followed a circuitous route from Hong Kong to Shanghai, Moji to Yokohama, picking up passengers along the way, and then finally journeyed across the Pacific to Vancouver. But when the ship finally arrived in Vancouver Harbor, the Dominion government had already revised and solidified the continuous journey provision, which had earlier been struck down, um, and added two other restrictions requiring migrants to have $200 and also disallowing Asian laborers and artisans. Um, the continuous journey provision, as it sounds, required all prospective migrants to make a continuous journey from the country of which they were a native or naturalized citizen, um, and there were, no long, there were no longer any steamship companies that made this direct journey, effectively prohibiting migration from India. So, I mean, there was this long discussion between the Dominion government and uh, the British imperial government, and the British imperial government um, sanctioned this particular legislation because it, it appeared to be applicable to everyone and not just Indians. And so they were, they thought that there wouldn't be any kind of agitation on the part of um, British Indian subjects. So this particular narrative of the Komagata Maru, as some of you might well know, has become an, an iconic historical narrative, a history that's condensed and consolidated through this particular photo. Is it the right one? The right. Yes, right. Oh, so through this, through this photo of Gurdit Singh, who is this man right here, with his seven-year-old son. So Gurdit Singh had, um, was, was a widower, and uh, he brought his son on the journey with him, and this is the, them standing with their men on, on deck. In Canadian historiography, the ship's journey is largely understood through the lens of restrictive immigration policies. So many scholars who have uh, written about the Komagata Maru have emphasized the Dominion government's exclusionary impulses and its aspirations to create a white Canada forever, a project that was, of course, manifest in a multiplicity of other provisions, including the segregation and assimilation of Aboriginal people, as well as in various forms of legislation aimed at Chinese and Japanese ex um, migrants. And while there's little doubt that the Komagata Maru was a pivotal moment in Canada's long history of racial exclusion, this prevailing focus has obscured and even repressed, or if I can use Sarita's um, sort of metaphor from Heidegger, framing um, has really sort of obscured and repressed other equally important narratives, mo most notably uh, itineraries of exchange and global encounters evident in the larger but less pertinent questions um, of mobility, diaspora, and transnational solidarities. So at quick glance, it's clear that the Komagata Maru's journey connected Britain, India, and Canada within a circuitous movement of people's legalities and violence. While in Vancouver, the passengers were forcibly detained aboard the ship for two months where they endured deplorable living conditions, including a shortage of food and water. So here's an image of the ship. Upon return to Calcutta, British authorities alleged that those arriving from their failed journey had been involved in seditious activities while abroad and were now undesirables, even criminals, who would stimulate anti-colonial sentiments in India. The ship's arrival in Calcutta precipitated a violent conflict that left at least 26 people dead and many more injured. And what this meant for Gurdit Singh was that he was sent back to an India that he had long departed and no longer knew, leaving his businesses, at least temporarily, and his life um, in Southeast Asia. Several scholars have usefully placed the Komagata Maru within the broader context of anti-colonial struggles, situating this event within the ongoing activities of the Gathers, for ex example, along the west coast of North America. And my own sort of objective is to think about what the ship meant in the context of, of India. Um, so what was its significance in India? Um, now that I've sufficiently introduced my object, I'd like to make a few sort of general remarks about the ship and the types of encounters and exchanges that it makes possible. So the ship, as many scholars have argued, is in and of itself an important object of investigation. Not only a mode of transportation, the ship was also a signifier of modernity, progress, superiority, as well as its undoing. Um, and the person who's written most famously about the ship is Gilroy. So for Paul Gilroy, the image of the ship as a living micro-cultural, micro-political system in motion is especially important for historical and theoretical reasons. 
Ships, he elaborates, immediately focus attention on the Middle Passage, on the various projects for redemptive return to the African homeland, on the circulation of ideas and activists, as well as the movement of key cultural and political artifacts, tracts, books, gramophone records, and choirs. And so the, the argument for, for Gilroy is that the ship is also a site of counter-modernity. As a locus of mobility, the ship does not merely signal an arrival um, on the coast of Vancouver, as it's been commonly conceived, but a discontinuous return, a set of circulations through different geographies and temporalities, precipitating various forms of sociality and unmooring a multiplicity of circulations. Um, the ship's voyage, I think, sort of contra Gilroy, um, not only signifies the material and symbolic currents and contiguities between metropole and colony, or in Gilroy's words, the movement of key cultural and political artifacts uh, between the old world and the new, between Africa and the Caribbean, but raises other critical sites of inquiry, the movements between administrative and settler colonies, between India, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Canada, configurations and mobilities of empire that have been less studied, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century, where the metropole colony divide has been the structuring mode in colonial and post-colonial studies. So focusing on the ship as an analytic category allows for an exploration not only of objects, but also changes in consciousness, sociality, and solidarity. And my own concern and sort of contribution to these, to thinking about these uh, changes in consciousness, sociality, and sociability is through the creation and mobility of legal lexicons and racial grammars. And in the interest of time, I wanted to sort of extract and, I, and give you sort of two examples, um, and, and then I'd be happy to sort of return to any questions that people have. Um, so one of the questions that I'm really concerned with in this project is how the ship supporters drew on languages of British uh, legal liberalism and on your European configurations of race and racial hierarchies to make their claims for inclusion within a wider imperial polity. Um, although the Kamagata Maru hasn't been a significant site or subject of study within, the, within Indian social or legal history, the ship's detention in Canadian waters and its return to India prompted a series of very lively debates and discussions in English language newspapers. Um, published and circulated in major urban localities, including Amritsar, Lahore, and Calcutta. The ship's journey was closely followed by Indians living in London as well, um, who also participated in these transnational discussions, contesting and condemning the Dominion government's actions. So as I said, what I'd like to do is to just give you sort of two brief uh, examples of the, of the types of circulations of legality and, race, and raciality that questions of global encounters might open up. Um, and how these might actually trouble, unravel, and unsettle dominant narratives that are tethered to the nation state. So let me begin with law. And what's interesting with, uh, with both law and race is that, as we heard this morning, um, you know, that race has a geography, right? Um, and so does law. So a lot of, I mean, there has been some very interesting work done by Lauren Benton, for example, um, but within the sort of late 19th and early 20th century, much of the investigations into questions of law and legality have really been framed around the nation state. So let's start with law. So in their efforts to protest the Kamagata Maru's detention, British Indian subjects, both in India and elsewhere across the empire, mobilized legal vo vocabularies to contest the unfair and un-English treatment of the ship and its passengers. And at some level, this seems un, sort of, um, perhaps even uninteresting, but unsurprising. Um, it's well known that Indian migrants challenged exclusionary laws all across the British Empire during the early 20th century, and British Columbia was certainly no exception. But legal struggles were much broader and more diffuse than these, um, than these, so often exceeding both formal sites of law as well as national boundaries and national borders. Indigenous and subaltern groups often turned to law to fight their exclusion and to make rights claims before judges. But colonial subjects also strategically mobilized languages of law and global public debates to contest the coerciveness of colonial rule and its illiberal logics of racial inequality. So these lexical strategies, I argue, proved to be crucial on two counts. First, allowing colonial subjects to engage administrators on their own terms, talking about the sort of readiness or what I've called the time of rights. Um, and secondly, enabling British Indian subjects to emphasize um, to emphasize their uh, 
shifting consciousness and their ability to enter the wider imperial polity. So law became a tactic both for effacing colonial difference and for emphasizing the sameness between British Indian subjects and their British uh, European counterparts. Indians have claimed that, so I'm just going to read a quote to you from the Civil uh, and Military Gazette. Indians have claimed that the rights which they enjoy in India and England should also be extended to them in the colonies. The colonial governments, they say, are making naught of the promise Queen Victoria gave to India, and as the King of England is king also of each colony, his promise ought to hold good in every unit of the empire. Making a very brief reference to the Komagata Maru, the Gazette asked its readers, how can the king both affirm and deny? How can he as emperor of India grant rights which he confirms as king of England, while as king of South Africa or king of Canada, he denies those rights? Um, and this precipitated a very sort of uh, protracted conversation in, um, in Indian papers. Um, but the answers to these questions, the Gazette implied, were contingent upon the temporality of British liberalism. Were British Indian subjects, like all other colored races across the empire, still in need of moral instruction and colonial tutelage, or had they reached a higher stage of, of development, had colonialism in India been successful, that prepared them for self-government? So the Tribune, a uh, Lahore newspaper, emphasized the maturity of British Indian subjects, highlighting precisely their demands for mobility and inclusion, um, specifying that it was precisely their ability to sort of um, articulate their demands through the language of law that demonstrated their readiness. Um, so the, the Tribune says, there is nothing remarkable in the people of India appreciating the rights and privileges of British Indian citizen, of British citizenship in various ways. Instead of this appreciation being a matter for irritation to a class of Englishmen, it should be better, it should be matter for congratulation. India is being much more and more absorbed into the British Empire, and the people are realizing that as British subjects, their future offers great possibilities of happiness. Such a feeling ought to be encouraged, and the people are not to be made to suffer inconvenience or pain in claiming the fullest rights of British citizenship. Rather than to punish Gurdjieff Singh and his passengers for attempting to gain entry into Canada, the Tribune urged that their journey should be regarded as a moment of historical progress and even triumph, one that illuminated the successes of colonial rule in India on the one hand and the paradoxes of the civilizing mission on the other. The British Empire, the the Tribune continued, surely stands on an infinitely more advantageous position than the old Roman Empire with its slave populations and barbarian hordes. The exigencies of empire today, the paper continued, stands on, a more, solid, on more solid foundations than the perpetuation of unequal and unjust barriers of, of advancement and growth of subject rationalities. By evoking cultural and legal differences between the British and Romans and their resulting empires, the Tribune emphasized the importance of justice and equality in the British ethos. Although British Indian subjects to enter, uh, allowing British Indian subjects to enter Canada is not a favor, the paper insisted, but a bare act of justice to India and justice to the British people, and its effect in cementing the bond of love and the attachment of the Indian people to the empire will be very great. So clearly, one of the strategies of, of Komagata Maru's supporters was to question what I, what I described earlier as the time of rights. Um, discussions in other papers suggested that British Indians saw themselves as fr fully matured modern subjects whose historical consciousness was fully evident in their lexical deployments of legal dis discourse and in their vocabularies and understandings of equality and justice. But this wasn't the only strategy deployed, and this gets me to the question of race. The Komagatamaru's supporters also drew upon prevailing European conceptions of race as developmental and hierarchical, and in so doing inserted themselves within a wider set of imperial taxonomies. To demonstrate their own readiness to migrate across the empire and become imperial citizens, Indian constituencies ins insisted that they were ready for rights, as they demonstrated a marked superiority to Britain's other colored races, most notably Africans. So to turn to the Civil and Military Gazette again, um, this is what they had to say about Canada's exclusionary policies. Indians are not only colored subjects of the British Crown. The empire contains Chinese, Malays, Polynesians, Red Indians, and Negroes in various stages of civilization or barbarism. Indians themselves would not maintain that a Hoopshi ought to have the same rights as an Englishman. Indians are carefully aware of the inferiority of the African natives, both to themselves and the Europeans. 
But unlike African natives, the Civil and Military Gazette argued, Indians were racially superior and were thus ready to govern, to self-govern at home and to live as equals in the imperial polity and in white settlement colonies, including Canada. So to further my sort of points on the circulation of legality and, race, and raciality and their productive, productive tensions, and to emphasize uh, the omissions, erasures, um, and or erasures that national histories may engender. Um, I want to just end with, oh, this is the return. This is the Komagata Murray leaving. I want to end with this image. So um, this image was actually published on May 3rd, 1914, 11 days before the Komagata Maru reached Vancouver Harbor. Um, and it was actually pu published in um, the Hindi Punch, which is a, a weekly satirical political cartoon uh, magazine, which is Parsi owned and published in Colonial Bombay. Um, so here Canada is represented, sorry, it's really bad copy, as a figure wearing a headdress and a wampum belt, and the wampum belt actually says Canada on it. Um, and the, the figure is, is uh, guarding the entrance to British Columbia and holding up a sign that says, notice, no Indians admitted. Um, and then, Miss Columbia, be gone, sir. Don't you see this notice? There's no place for such as you here. Indian, ha, suppose I put up a similar notice on the doorsteps of my Indian home against you. Miss Columbia, I know you can't, you daren't. And beneath the, the image is um, the sort of narration of uh, the Kamagata Maru's arrival. It is reported that the Kamagata Maru has sailed from Shanghai for Victoria with 400 Hindus on board, seeking entry into British Columbia. Um, all will be refused landing under the order of council, excluding Asiatic artisans and laborers. The vessel is said to be under charter to a wealthy East Indian named Gurdit Singh. So I'll end here and hopefully we'll have time for questions. In order to conceptualize the idea of a global encounter, um, as well as his charge that we speak informally, which I will take to mean I don't need to think about coherence or an argument, um, which is useful because your, his invitation came at a time when I've been questioning my own disciplinary relationship to the study of Asian migrations. Um, what is the role of literary and cultural studies in engaging this ever changing cultural, political, historical landscape that we call global Vancouver? Uh, and I'm actually not going to talk about literature today, but what I do want to do is actually quite take literally your invitation to think out loud and to think through how I might uh, approach this particular question. Uh, and I should mention that the most immediate impetus for asking these questions has been my participation in a collective interdisciplinary project with uh, Gu Sheng, who teaches in the fine arts here at UBC, and Jennifer Chun, uh, my colleague in sociology, my, a colleague in sociology who specializes in labor movements and global ethnography. So here we are. This is not, this is not how we do research. Um, but this is a pretty good image of how interdisciplinary collaboration works, right? Um, and the Waterscapes project um, is a three-year project that comes out of Gu Sheng's recent art practice in which he brings together the two rivers in his life, one being the Yangtze River in China. Gu is from Chongqing, which is, in fact, population-wise, at least the largest metropolis in the world. Um, down river in inland China, um, down from the Free, Three Gorges Dam, and then the other being the Fraser River after Gu came to Canada in 1990. Uh, and so he's been working on installation pieces and other pieces that have been bringing these rivers together. Um, and this project was an invitation for the two of us to engage in this process of working out how do you compare and think about two different spaces and what are the cultures that this implies and what are the questions that it would raise for two academics in different disciplines to engage the work that he's doing in a very personal artistic practice. Um, this is a uh, drawing that Gu made to help us conceptualize the Waterscapes project. And you notice that in the, in the corner there, um, Vancouver and Shanghai are just right next to each other. Right, Vancouver, Shanghai. And, and in fact, uh, what he captures here is in fact the very visceral reality in Vancouver that Shanghai often feels much closer than Quinell and Kamloops when you're in Vancouver. Right, so how do we understand these kinds of global encounters. Um, I should notice, I, and this gets to the, um, the 
installation of boats that I'm going to talk about towards the end of this talk. Um, I should also note that um, our project is funded by a research creation grant from SHRC, uh, and the purpose of which is to facilitate collaboration between artists and more conventional academics to rethink what research can do. Uh, and who we can reach with our research, which is really wonderful on paper, but turns out to be incredibly difficult in practice. Um, at our last meeting, which was about a month ago, um, we were trying to plan our research commitments for the year, and we found that the hard part wasn't so much working through our busy schedules, um, but coming up with a plan that would lead to reasonably lead to research results for all three of us. Right, we, so we need to formulate a plan that could satisfy the requirements of three different disciplines, um, which also meant that not only did we have to ensure that our own research needs were satisfied, but also those on the, others, on the, on the other team, right? those others on our team. And so um, from all the advice I've gotten for pre-tenure faculty, uh, giving time for someone else's research without benefiting your own seems like a bad idea. <laughs> Um, and, and there is, of course, an irony here, right, which is that um, the three of us like to think of ourselves as working on the edges of our disciplines when we're in our home departments, right? But when it actually came to working with someone from outside our discipline, we found ourselves hiding behind the safe walls of our discipline, right? So asked to abandon our methodological trenches, we in fact found ourselves not in a realm of intellectual freedom, but instead floundering around looking for disciplinary validation. Uh, which has led me to think more broadly about the tremendous currency that interdisciplinarity has right now in the academy. And having recently sat on a couple of uh, search committees and graduate missions committees, it's just striking how many applications you read that say they are global and interdisciplinary. Um, and I find myself almost perversely looking for the application that says that they're local and parochial. Because <laughs> it might actually be, uh, and, and, and I say that of course, you know, confessing that I'm just as guilty as presenting my own research in this way. Um, but working with Gu and Jenny um, has really alerted me to the kinds of data gain negotiations and frictions that has to frame interdisciplinary work and what that might mean in our current moment. Um, so I begin with these observations um, because I think many of us instinctively turn to interdisciplinarity in order to think about Asian migrations. I think part of that comes out of our critique of colonial epistemologies in our home disciplines and how we look outside our discipline to find like-minded community ideas, etc. Which brings up the question then, um, how do disciplinary encounters help us think about global encounters? Or, or how would we know a global encounter within our disciplinary language? And so in order to un unpack uh, these questions, the object I want to think about is the boat. Um, and I also want to mention, I'm going to be very purposely e-rigorous when I'm talking about boats, unlike, unlike Renice's presentation. Um, I'm going to use boats and ships very interchangeably, uh, and I'm not going to try to settle on what exactly I'm talking about for reasons which I hope uh, will become clear. Um, what I want to do is I want to think through this object and then hopefully think through the ways in which I think through this object. Um, and just to begin by saying that to use boats to talk about Asian migration seems to be an exercise in stating the obvious. So I thought I would just do a quick brainstorm of possibilities. I took out my Komagata Maru slide last night. Um, here, for example, is the FOB, right? The fresh off the boat. And you see in the bottom here of uh, the cartoon, uh, they're quarreling about some girl, apparently. You know, maybe I think you're right for her, all right. Maybe I don't think you're worthy of her. Maybe I think she can do better than an FOB like you. And you have the smack in that last, you know, uh, corner of that cartoon there, right? So the, the, a common used term in slang to talk about new immigrants, right? FOB, fresh off the boat. Um, a more, much more serious connection between Asian migration and boats um, sorry, are, of course, um, boat people, right? And that's a very common term used for refugees, especially from Southeast Asia. And um, just to another more historical example, maybe this is a picture of the Empress of Japan. This is an ocean liner owned by the Canadian Pacific Railway that used to go between the Americas and Asia, and in fact, other places in the world as well. And I mentioned this because, um, for those of you who have time to visit, the UBC Library has a wonderful Chinese-Canadian history collection called the Chung Collection, in which there's a, full, uh, there's a replica of one of these boats um, in which, uh, in fact, every lifeboat on the replica took 53 pieces to put together. So it's an incredibly intricate model. Um, these are, of course, very different cases, very different examples of the boat. Uh, but in all of them, the boat functions as the technological means for the movement of bodies, commodities, and or cultures. And so there's a logic behind associating boats with Asian migrants, right? A connection that holds our imagination, even though, of course, the number of Asians arriving today on boats is probably quite small, 
right? Um, and the other thing to mention is that it's precisely this connection that I'm interested in uh, because I think most of us, at least in the English department, um, don't really think about how boats actually work. Like, I couldn't actually tell you how a boat floats, right? Which seems quite central to this whole object. I'm interested, in other words, in the cultural connections and why that means a kind of evacuation of its materiality or technology. Um, indeed, the boat structure is what we might call a tropology, a constellation of references, phrases, images, and texts that point to the major role played by boats, historically as well as today, in the instigation of global encounters. The contrast between actual boats and what they represent suggests a much more complex process of meaning making in which boats stand in for histories, cultures, and peoples. So I've been trying to think about how boats function, therefore, as figures for migration. And to do that, I, um, I did the same thing that Renisa did, which is I opened my Paul Gilroy and found, in fact, the, the exact same quote that you read about how boats <laughs> um, focus attention in the Middle Passage on the various projects for redemptive return, on the circulation of ideas and activists, as well as the movements of key cultural and political artifacts, tracks, books, gramophone records, and choirs. But I would wanted to look deeper into Gilroy's use of the ship, he's talking about ships here, and how it allows him to formulate a more general theory of diaspora. So like any good scholar, I did the most obvious thing, which is I looked up ships in the index. Um, and notice that after the four-page references given for the word ships, the index instructs me to, quote, see also sailors. Now the interchangeability of ships and sailors um, which is actually, in fact, the case if you look up all these references, makes a key, if in fact, uh, retrospectively obvious point, which is that what ultimately concerns Gilroy and much of diaspora cultural studies are the sailors, not the ships. Right? This seems to be a general rule of thumb. We're always more interested in those who came by the boats than the boats themselves. Um, in a recent article, uh, Lily Cho at the University of Western Ontario brings together African and Asian diasporas by meditating on the fact that uh, some of the ships that were once used to transport slaves from Africa were then, after the abolishment of slavery, used to transport indentured laborers from Asia to the Americas. And for Cho, it's this continuity that offers an entree into how to theorize diaspora cultures. And I'm going to uh, read a slightly longer passage because it really brings home, I think, what's at stake. Um, Cho writes, the average journey from Macau to Havana took more than half a year. What happened in that time? What kinds of bonds were formed? What, which communities emerge from these experiences? How do they resonate in community culture? Ships carry a resonance, the memory of confinement, passage, and transformation beyond that of the journey itself. Displacements and migrations are not simply about people moving from one place to another. Rather, the processes of displacement carry within them a memory tied to the materiality of ships, of passages, of the months and the days spent at sea in abysmal conditions and under constant threat. Diasporas are formed not only by the act of moving from place to place, from one place to another, but also by what happens along the way. And as far as I can tell, this is what's at stake in thinking about the boat as a figure for Asian migration. Not, again, because of the boats themselves, but because of what they tell us about the people whose lives they shape. So I want to suggest um, that we need to think of boats as metaphors and figures in order to understand the work that they do in helping us narrate global encounters. Because it is as a metaphor that boats help us understand encounters, movements, and itineraries. And indeed, I would also suggest that thinking about boats as metaphors opens up a parallel between the mo movements of goods and peoples on the one hand, and the movement of ideas and meanings on the other hand via language. Boats, in other words, helps us illustrate how language itself operates via its itineraries of exchange. After all, the word metaphor comes from a, the Greek root meaning to carry, to bear, and to transfer. The boat, in other words, is a metaphor for metaphor itself. Um, but it's also an ambivalent one, because it's not clear to me whether boats help us understand how language works, or whether it's the other way around. Um, that is, our understanding of how boats work is in fact based on how our understandings of how language works, which is to say, what exactly does it mean to carry an idea from place to place? Or as Paul Demon memorably wrote, we have no way of defining, of policing the boundaries that separate the name of one entity from the name of another. This is where he goes metaphorical. Tropes are just travelers. 
they tend to be smugglers, and smugglers of stolen goods at that. What, matters, what makes matters even worse is that there is no way of finding out whether they do so with criminal intent or not." Unquote. So as I suggested earlier, in a large swath of diaspora cultural studies, the boat functions as a trope for the people who journey in them. And again, this is a kind of metaphor, um, although to be more strict, it's a kind of metonymy. Uh, one that allows an abstract figure, the boat, to elicit the diverse stories of those who were confined in them, those who were complicit in their sometimes deadly journeys, and maybe for all of us who live in societies that still bear the scars of their voyages. Because as Gilroy's index tells us, if you want to look for ships, you've got to look for the sailors. And so for the last part of my talk, I want to go back to my collaboration with Gu Sheng and Jennifer Chan. This is the piece, of course, that's outside our theater that you've looked at today. Um, Becoming Rivers, uh, is, which is the name of the installation, consists of about 2,000 plastic boats that were formed into two rivers, first on the outside of the museum, then coming into the museum, uh, that come together inside the gallery over there in front of a stylized painting of both the Yangtze and the Fraser Rivers that's take, adapted from satellite photos. And this, that's the painting that you see at the end of the uh, piece. And, uh, over the last two months, I've been documenting and sort of reflecting on the process of how this uh, installation was put together, and mostly because I was just curious, actually, to how one puts an installation together, and I figured I had an opportunity to finally figure this out. Um, but even though I saw the installation being put together step by step, I was not prepared for the visual effect of the final product. And as I did earlier today, I find myself on several occasions just wandering through the installation, both indoors and outdoors, just sort of mesmerized by the sheer presence of all these boats, the sheer power of being surrounded by boats and sometimes they're swaying kind of gently in the wind and, or outside they're just kind of, they seem to be kind of crawling next to the museum. Now, Gu's project statement emphasizes how this installation stems from his own experiences as an immigrant. And in this sense, the boat is once again a powerful metaphor for his ongoing process of identity formation. And I'll just quote a brief excerpt. This is from the piece that's on the wall next to the painting. As children, we always loved to fold, bo uh, to fold paper boats and float them down the stream. We believed that they carried our hopes for the future especially for going out into the world, into unknown places. I learned that you have to jump into the river and swim a long distance to experience another culture and to be open to benefiting from differences. Now, when I actually saw the completed installation for the first time, uh, I have to say my reaction actually caught me by surprise because instead of evoking Gu's personal narrative, which I've been pretty familiar with after working with him on this project, um, I was actually struck by the massness of the boats in their thousands, right? the, and the power of that image of mass boats in light of Asian Canadian histories. And what I have in mind is that the fact, known to some of you, that every couple of years, um, boatloads of refugees arrive on Canadian shores from places like China, India, and Sri Lanka. And these are passengers who survive incredibly dangerous journeys, often as indentured laborers beholden to international human trafficking networks. And although the destination of many of these migrants are the metropolises in the US, um, when they arrive in Canada, that almost inevitably sets off a wave of racialized and often racist hysteria about the security of our borders. And so as incendiary rhetoric about sending people home pours out of our most respectable newspapers, one can't help but be reminded of the fact that the fear of being inundated by Asians is one of the oldest themes in anti-Asian racism in North America. And this is something, of course, that relates to um, the Komagata Maru as well. Um, or as activist and scholar Rita Wong points out, after four boatloads of Chinese refugees arrived in 1999, amidst calls for immediate deportation and the, incar and the incarceration of some of these women for up to 18 months, there were a lot more calls um, offering to adopt a dog that came in with the boats. So I couldn't help but see Becoming Rivers as a bold staging of precisely these fears. This is the outside. Um, if you haven't seen, you can see from the window there. Because after all, thousands of boats are emerging from the ocean and they're occupying our land, uh, or at least um, 
we can say that if we conveniently forget the arrival of other voyages that turned our land into a settler colony to begin with. And this is, of course, a history that Asian migrants are themselves complicit in and opens up another conversation which we might have later on. Um, the boats then crash through the windows and walls of our most cherished educational institutions. Um, and uh, a museum of anthropology, no less. And so I've, um, but I should mention that I've been most, and this is the focus of a one, one of these particular boats, I've been most haunted by the fact that in this installation, all the boats are empty, right? There are actually no people, there are no goods, there are, there's nothing material that we can translate here, right? In fact, what is striking about the boats is their abstract and repetitive quality. And Karen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are only three molds of boats that are on display. So there's only three types of, three designs that are on display. And so even though this installation makes reference to human migrations, it purposely excludes the representation of those very bodies. And in doing so, it raises, I think, very different questions. Can we think about Asian diasporas without Asians? To what extent is Asian migration an invention of, an, of a racist imaginary? And how do these narratives impact the lives of actual Asian migrants? So even though the boats that we see have no people, does their repetitive quality reflect the stereotypical function of words like Asian and migrant? And I'll just end by saying that the absence of people haunts me in this particular installation because it obstructs my desire for this installation to articulate an accessible politics, uh, it, it obstructs my desire for this installation to address the power relations that render some migrants into privileged subjects and others into victims of indenture. What I want, what I think I desperately want, is for Becoming Rivers to speak of and for the human, right? to mitigate the abstract categories of identity, to open up realms of history and experience for me that I would not have thought about. But that, in fact, is not what the installation is doing. And I'm not suggesting that uh, becoming Rivers is cold-hearted or cynical, and nor am I forgetting that it grows out of a moving personal story. But what I find unsettling is the way in which it resists my attempts to discipline it and forces me instead to admit um, and to interrogate the assumptions that I rely on in order to make meaning of it. In other words, it stages a disciplinary encounter that suspends my own disciplinarity and in doing so pushes me to think again what exactly is a global encounter. Thank you. Describing this panel as uh, consisting of an anthropologist, a sociologist, and a literary scholar, more than one person commented that that sounds like the beginning of a joke. And um, I guess picking a medievalist as the commentator is uh, Neil's idea of a punchline. Yeah? But of course, global encounters and what has really been standing out about this conference is not only the the great scope geographically and across time, but also across the disciplines being really multidisciplinary and also having itineraries of exchange across disciplinary boundaries and domains. And I think this focus on objects and their constructed and often contested meanings really serve as our map also in these kinds of itineraries of exchange. So instead of adding my own object, I used the ones that have been offered by our speakers to guide my comments, and I'll just flag my own two-minute notice, and I'll promise to be brief so that we have some time left for questions. Um, most obviously, there are three objects, the Tata Indica, the Komagata Maru, and the boats are all vehicles. They are artifacts that facilitate or at least symbolize the very exchanges and encounters that we've been talking about these last few days. More interestingly, they also all speak to an appropriation, a refashioning of these vehicles in or by what used to be called the periphery. And this, I think, is of some import, especially as we're dealing with imperialism, uh, colonialism, and its legacies. As we heard, the steamship Komagata Maru was built in Scotland in the late 1880s, entered service 
1890 for a German line, and in 1913 was acquired by a Japanese company that gave it its new name, and later on it gave it yet another name um, after this one, Komagato Maru, had acquired this degree of notoriety. Here the steamship, this key symbol of 19th century Western imperialism in Asia, was employed not in a core periphery exchange, bringing Asian surpluses back to Europe, but purchased by an Asian company and then used in the attempt to facilitate migration from India to Canada from a British colony to a British dominion. Gu Jong's boats, in Chris Lee's interpretation, are a trope for many Komagato Marus, symbolically linking the Yangtze River and the Fraser River and the manifold exchanges and waves of migrations that connected China to Canada's Pacific coast. And similarly, the Tata Indica is a refashioning and arguably even a naturalization of another emblematic technology and artifact of Western economic supremacy, the fossil fuel powered automobile. It was certainly marketed in India with an appellation to patriotic pride, a pride that was further heightened when in 2008, Tata Motors acquired uh, Jaguar and Land Rover, makers of the vehicles of choice of British royalty, officialdom, and of course, its armed forces. IT in general may be seen as another more ephemeral vehicle of mobility and exchange, and again, we can trace a trajectory of appropriation and refashioning from the outsourcing of menial tasks to India by Western software giants to Indian companies like Infosys becoming major players in the global marketplace, competing with the very companies that they formerly serviced. But at the same time, to me, these vehicles and their readings are also resonant of the reaction to and the rejection of mobile agents, migraines, migrants, itinerants. Alongside the desire to pin down, to define, to fix borders that we saw, for instance, in Giancarlo's presentation of the Ottoman world map, into increasingly rigid and then, as we heard earlier, also increasingly racialized geographies, more and more people got stuck sometime, as in the Komagato Maru, quite literally got stuck in between these rigidly fixed geographies constructed as there were, these spaces in between that have been really the scene, the setting of most of these encounters and these exchanges that we've been talking about, what yesterday was described as the middle ground. And I leave it at that and invite our speakers to field your questions. Thank you. It's on, it's on, oh, yes. Um, the, so I had a comment, panel was great, but I had a comment primarily for Renisa, and um, not surprisingly, it has to do with the Indian versus Indian image. And uh, is that 1911? Is that when that was dated? No, it was 1914. 1914. Um, I have a sense of who that, I, don't, I think that might have been representing actually a real person who was a figure um, from that time period. Um, in the 1909 World's Fair in Seattle, the most famous person at the fair who um, um, achieved a lot of notoriety, won the big beauty contest, won a, a suburban lot to live on, and so on, was a Labrador Inuit woman named Miss Columbia. And I'm just wondering if, if that image there isn't tapping into some sort of, just a couple of years previously, some sort of really large event that you know, millions of people attended this thing, including many Canadians. And it would be interesting to see if that's, if her image, which has already been navigating around for a while now gets used in this particular way but i think she may not just be a generic representation i think she might be real yeah i mean i think that that's a great a great point and at this point i have no idea right mm -hmm. i mean i think that um uh that you know miss columbia is also british columbia right um but certainly i mean i i and what's interesting about the image is that it is um, reproduced in a Parsi-owned newspaper or a Parsi-owned magazine. Um, so I don't know at this point, but that. But thanks. That's a great sort of tip to to follow up on. Josh, um, just wait for the microphone, please. Do I have to do the as
So my question is for Sarita. Um, my question is, um, using the Heideggerian in framing um, idea, um, how, how does that relate to um, the agency? Like how would you describe or explain the relationship between the inframing and, and the agency? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Yeah, um, I guess for me what the, the Heideggerian argument does, and I think it comes in two parts. The first is in his essay called Questioning Concerning Technology, where he talks about the fundamental relationship between humanity and technology being one in which the extension of human capabilities through technology frames the world in which humans operate, including humans themselves. And he stages that as a problem in which modern technologies frame humans as a standing reserve for capital, capital and technolo technological expansion. But see, the other part of his argument comes in the essay called The Thing, in which he says that um, the world of modern technology just throws up the problem of creating nearness, that there's a difference between distanceless and, and nearness. And bringing those two frames of reference together, I like to think about both how certain uh, ideas of the world are framed. So in other words, how computer technologies frame the world as one of global instantaneous interconnectivity, when clearly there's more to it than that. But at the same time, uh, it, it also throws up this question to agents and actors of how to create, in a world of distanceness, close social familial relations, both through, objects, uh, through the objects that they employ. So I think I would locate the agency in that later uh, move, set of moves, in which uh, everyone is engaged in trying to create out of a world of fastness and speed to some degree, uh, meaningful social relations. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, and this may not be entirely germane, but whether it's worth looking at the way in which, say, migrant ships appearing on the coast of the Pacific versus the Atlantic coast of North America um, it's it's uh, that in the in the case of the Pacific, it's usually seen as almost uniformly suspicious in the framework of this white North America forever attitude. Whereas, I mean, the appearance of ships on the coast of the Atlantic, I mean, there there is the issue of the privileged white European immigrants, i.e., the ideal immigrants. Um, and in in this context, it could also fit as well the idea of the uh, the slave ships in the context of it being. Uh, in, of course, the sense of 19th century or 18th century capitalism, uh, the, the labor force that drives the engines of economic what progress. Yeah, I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a really good um, observation. Um, I, I don't want to say, I mean, I don't want to say that all ships even bring Asian migrants to BC were considered necessarily suspect and therefore treated as, like, as a Komagata Maru was treated, um, because that wasn't necessarily the case. I mean, of course, there was anti-Asian racism, but it was also a very clear need for Asian labor, and even before BC entered Confederation, there, was much, there were different um, demographic mixes. Um, so, I, but I think, you're, I think as a general observation, I think that's really well taken. I don't have much to add to that. Well, and I guess, I mean, if, you know, the, I think that what, the ship really demonstrates is, or responses to the sh to ships on the Pacific really demonstrate is this deep ambivalence, right? That on the one hand, the Asian is so deeply central to the sort of materiality of the landscape to ensuring that, you know, commerce and capitalism and empire thrive, and yet it's always about what the Asian's going to take away, right? And the, the sort of, the specificity of that changes over time. Um, so, you know, it, it might be, um, uh, well, most recently with the, with the 1999 um, episode, it was, you know, about health, right, uh, and about criminality and potential terrorism. And so these tropes are constantly evolving, but I think what they, you know, what the ship really demonstrates is the profound sort of ambivalence of, of what the Asian body actually means and its use.
just have a question about the boats, and either of you could answer it. But it does come out of Chris's talk, and my question is, why, why does the boat have to lose its materiality and become a metaphor in order to be an effective actor in these stories? Is, is that necessary? Um, is that necessary? I don't think that's necessary, but I think that is part of the process of what happens as we proliferate meanings of boats. Um, I don't think that's a necessary... I, I mean, in other words, which is to say that, in fact, one could do a reading of this particular installation and read all the sort of historical specificity back into it. And I think part of, partly the images try to do that, but even the images are interesting um, because when uh, Jennifer and I first saw the images, what we also noticed was the kind of inhumanness of these images. Um, and so, for me, I don't want to suggest that it has to necessarily go towards this sort of evacuation of the material, but I am kind of interested in what happens when we kind of pursue that possibility, right? That there is sort of a truth to the repeated nature of the boats, and there's a truth to the kind of abstractness of this installation. Um, I mean, what's interesting, of course, is that these plastic boats are themselves representations of paper boats, right? So we have a kind of, which is, of course, another kind of crafted abstraction of, of real boats. I mean, whenever we actually get to the real boat. So I love the fact that, you know, for Gu, there, there are always these kind of, in his mind or in his practice, there are always these kind of abstractions and kind of recycling that's going on. Um, and I think there's, there's something worth paying attention to there. That's, I think that's where I would take that. If that's, yeah, did you want to? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess when, um, when I was listening to Chris talk, I mean, for me, the materiality of the ship is really key, right? Because, um, you know, I think that uh, the, the spatiality, the kinds of intimacies and closeness that that produces, right? The, um, the various rituals of food consumption, for example, or of, um, of occupying space, I think is really central. And so, you know, I would make the claim that the ship's materiality is really key, that it's not, you know, it's that the metaphor for me just doesn't sort of go far enough. And, and I mean, you know, in this sort of spirit of, um, well, of the work in geography around the human and the non-human, I mean, you know, the ship and the ocean has a particular agency as well that I think we need to sort of think about in the context of migration. Um, and I think where, where this is really beautifully captured is in Amitav Ghosh's Sea of Poppies. Uh, both the sort of the materiality of the ship, the agency of the water, the um, closeness of the people, you know, the ways in which social relations around caste, for example, change dramatically in the sort of confines of this um, of the ship itself. I have more of a comment, and maybe it's about trying to think also interdisciplinarily. Um, I was just really struck by the similarity of form of the empty white boat and the black windowed um, Tata Indica car and the way um, that in the material sense um, people are mingled together and that are from different histories and relationships to place within this intimate space. Um, and I, I don't think I have anything deeper to say than that, but just trying to think through, thinking across that, what could further the kinds of thinking that you're trying to do. Um, a few disjointed thoughts, but um, uh, I thought particularly your comment or, or that long quote about the transformative nature of the space of the the boat itself is very important. Um, and maybe think also of the sort of dissolution of Captain Cook too long at sea. But there's something about, therefore, the experience of traveling, especially we forget, you know, six months, not six hours. And, you know, even the experience of getting on a plane, being completely depersonalized by security and by the regimes of travel, you arrive here, and you have your little suitcase and you try and reconstitute who you're supposed to be in this new space. Now, that's maybe not 
traumatic with a big T, but you know, I must say that it's wearing as a, as a modern condition of constantly de being deconstructed and reconstructing yourself in a new space. So how much more important is the six months, however long it is, in which really you're transformed, which makes me think that, you know, in that itinerary of global exchange, you know, you're no longer the same as you move along that itinerary. And actually narrating yourself back into a homeland becomes at least as important as, you know, the enigma of arrival, as V.S. Naipaul, you know, wrote with regard to, you know, Indian immigration to Trinidad. I mean, that's also, I think, you know, the consequence of any kind of travel forced or coerced. Um, so I think it's very important to pay attention to the transformative power of that space. And I just wanted to append, you know, one other comment which does relate to the Tata, it relates to, uh, to some extent, you know, it's the whiteness, it's the abstract nature of it. But I just wanted to put in uh, that in the Aztec codices, the first ships were represented as birds, as doves. And that's what I thought when I came in the museum and found these things being fairly tall, coming right past my face and head. So I just, for a moment, you know, had a very nice conjunction of how the Aztecs saw boats for the first time, not as things on the water at all, but as things floating above it, and how in this exhibition, similarly, the boats fly, and the Tata Indica as a white thing is also sort of absent of any meaning or marking uh, in, its, in your first apprehension. Can I just add a, a thought to that, which was to do with the car, um, which was, I wondered whether the, I mean, when I saw it and you were talking about the ornamentation or the lack of ornamentation, I thought, um, well, is this to do with a kind of Western image of, of, which connects to what the job is, right? Because, I mean, I don't know about this except from films and books and stuff, but the idea of the call center worker having to pass, you know, for a European in terms of the voice and sort of local knowledge and so on. Um, if that, you could say, well, if the, does anyone ever say, well, the reason we don't have ornamentation in the car is because it's supposed to be a kind of Western looking car or European, because it looks just like a, you know, like a European car, right? So does anyone ever see it in that way? Because if it does, then you could say that the kind of passing process begins as soon as you get into the car. So, yeah, let me address myself to that because I was thinking about that as I was hearing Sasha's question as well. Um, yeah, I think that moment of transformation is supposed to happen the minute you step out of your home. So the car is a continuation of the space of the call center in, as it were, into the space of the city and protecting that site of call center work from all of the dirt and inconveniences of the city. But at the same time, and much more ambivalently, it's a space of intimate contact. Even though they're not in the car for six months, they might be in the car for two hours or half an hour, um, there, are, there are these uh, intimate relations that are created within it which can be quite fraught with sexuality and, and forms of crossing class boundaries or, or caste boundaries. And on that note, just to mention, um, there's this uh, a very lovely piece by Ravi Sundaram in his new book called Pirate Modernity about car crashes in Delhi. And he talks about the car as representing a new kind of kinetic sub subjectivity as a way of inhabiting the space that's both highly desirable and also highly dangerous. And he talks about the front of buses, which are kind of a male domain. They're marked out with the body of the driver, and, and they have music playing and stuff, and the passengers sit in the front. And as I was reading that, I was thinking that the Western car, in a sense, in terms of its let, uh, layout, is erasing some of those marked boundaries between male domains in the front and passenger domains in the back, and becomes a kind of uh, a site filled with worry. And then in terms of whether the, the Tata uh, Indica call center cars are simply Western cars and that's the lack of ornamentation, well, that's certainly the case. There's a way in which they're hyper uh, uh, clean, that's the only way I can put it, Hi stripped of ornamentation and also meticulously maintained in a way that private vehicles, um, which are also European, 
or Japanese are not. They're allowed to accumulate dust on the outside and have murtis or various religious things in the front of the car. And these have been kind of sanitized of all of that. So it's on a, almost a hyper-Westernization of that vehicle. Thank you. Comment. Okay, then we're all out of time, and I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers for their wonderful contributions. <laughs>